Hi guys, here a little update of my DIY lathe and uh, to give some answers uh, to the questions you left in the comment sections of the various videos of this series. Though before talking about this, uh, I would like to talk uh, about the time this project is taking. Uh, the major reason this project is taking so much time is because I'm doing this in my spare time. While I designed some small lightweight machines in the past, this is the very first time I endeavor in this kind of project uh, <laughs> to say metal that cuts metal. <laughs> so uh, I had to learn a lot of things and uh, think uh, well how to do the things and uh, and did a lot of mistakes so uh, and to correct them so um, i understand that out there there are people that made uh, uh, their own uh, diy lathe at home uh, very uh, quickly apparently easily and without any fault but for sure they are much better than me in metal working and uh, likely they know how to do the things this project takes a lot of time even because i want to reach a decent precision and by precision i mean something around one hundredth of a millimeter so i think this is kind of a word of warning uh, for you guys that enthusiastically watch videos like mine about the challenges a project like this poses. Okay, let's get started with the first question. Could be the ways be twisted? Well, I've made uh, the ways in a way, <laughs> sorry for the pun, that uh, uh, were always meant to have two races uh, over which uh, the carriage will slide. Uh, when I did the video where uh, I shown the making of, of the ways, uh, uh, someone among you guys uh, pointed out that uh, despite having made the race flat, uh, those races could be twisted among each other. He was right. And because the body uh, was milled not so very good, it was off of uh, uh, one tenth of a millimeter, which is a lot. Uh, I decided to check the ensemble with the ways uh, installed on the body, and uh, it went out that it had uh, it had some unacceptable errors. Uh, and uh, I performed this measurement with the, the help of a flat surface that I had the luck uh, to recover from a dismantled measuring machine. And I've made the, uh, this, this tool uh, that uh, holds uh, a comparator to check the flatness of the ways uh, in reference to such a subface plate. And uh, also I, I made uh, this makeshift uh, uh, this makeshift tool that helped me uh, to remove the material in excess, uh, making a sort of uh, manual shaper. <laughs> it took me a lot of time. As I said before, likely because I'm not a machinist uh, or neither a, a constructor or metal worker, uh, most of the time was spent in figuring out how to deal with this job. Eventually I was able to make a race, the races flat uh, among each other with a maximum error of plus minus one hundredth of a millimeter along all the 860 millimeter length. Another guy asked why did you use steel on steel insta instead of bronze on steel for the slide? On the slides I didn't interpose a bronze or the slide in contact with steel. Firstly, because uh, bronze uh, is not available in uh, flat bars, so I was forced to use another material. Uh, and uh, a softer alternative was brass, but brass against mild steel shows an annoying static coefficient of friction, while 
steel on steel shows an almost identical static versus dynamic coefficient of friction. Uh, in other words, uh, steel on steel shows less slick slip, stick slip, stick slip, stick slip phenomena. So that's why I chose uh, steel. But I reserved the possibility to interpose a thin sheet of brass in the future. Another point was spindles holder clamps uh, are too flimsy. The clamps are made by cutting with a plasma torch from a single 20 mm sheet of my steel. There are no wellings, it is a monolithic piece of steel. I double checked the calculations with the help of a fellow engineer and it went out that the clamps should withstand, the, should withstand the forces exerted when the machine is in operation and to tear apart one side of a clamp an equivalent force of more than 2400 kilograms should be exerted. If a part were held on the spindle on that, and that part is out of balance and put in rotation at a sufficient speed to reach 240 Newton of force, of centrifugal force, the whole lathe would jump in the room before the clamp breaks. However, that observation was indeed useful to spot the flow. The real problem lies on the fatigue limit that could lead to a failure after a given number of cycles. In fact, suppose an unbalanced part is kept on the jaws of the chuck and put in rotation. This will generate an, an oscillating force on the clamps and despite the average zero force, it could cause a failure due to fatigue. This could be particularly true in the case of a micro crack or defeat in the metal that would act as a trigger to start a major crack that grows and propagates deeply into the metal at its cycle. The, to avoid this problem, the literature suggests to adopt a ratio of one third to one fourth of the ultimate shear stress. The clamps by themselves would be enough to avoid this problem, but uh, because they are separated, two separated elements uh, that are kept in place uh, by just one screw each. It represents a serious weakness. So I've made uh, a modification, uh, making a cage that uh, not only um, held uh, together the, the clamps, uh, but also I added four more screws for an enhanced robustness. And yes, the problem that the whole lathe would jump in the room if an unbalanced mass held in rotation was not yet resolved. Another question was uh, thermal expansion in the spindle axle. Was more an observation than an, uh, a question? But yes, there is a risk of thermal expansion of the spindle's axle that in turn would compress the bearings to the point that could rise their friction, developing more heat that in turn would increase the expansion, the such expansion, causing a runaway up to the point that the spindle could seize. To limit this risk, a ring that acts as a spring was actually put in place when I assembled the spindle. One guy also observed that the screws that keep in place the ways could accumulate chips. I was aware of this and my plan was to cover the screws with an aluminum stripe as you can see here. One guy asked me if it wasn't easier and convenient to directly buy a lathe. Yes, it was. But well, I wouldn't have learned much. I wouldn't gain the sensitivity required to understand what actually is a thing like 10 microns or working with 20 mm sheet of metal. Furthermore, my lathe uh, fit my needs and uh, it is conceived to work differently and directly controlled by electric motors. But this is matter for future videos, so for now that's all folks. 
my sincere thanks go to those of you that contribute with comments without them i would have had the chance to address some mistakes or to get better results so i renew my invite to comment share and if you really like my videos click on the thumb up icon see you next time bye